Hello everybody, and welcome back to a brand new video. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at the 2022 gubernatorial elections through the lens of races that are being talked about as potentially competitive and whether they're truly competitive or just fool's gold and not really actually worth discussing. So um, before we get into this, please like this video, please subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell. Again, we only have you know, 20 days till the midterms and I'll be posting daily content. You won't want to miss a thing because everything's moving so fast and hitting that subscribe bell, hitting that notifications bell is going to ensure you don't miss another one of my uploads between now and election day. And so um, with more videos like these on your way, I, on my way, I think, um, you know, I, I, I think it would be a good decision if you subscribe. So anyways, Let's talk about these races. So I've got five truly competitive races and five fool's gold races that we'll be analyzing here. And again, um, some states are just not going to be filled in. Like California, for example, uh, no one thinks California is competitive, right? And so it's not really worth talking about it because I think we all agree that. Uh, but, you know, some people might disagree on Oregon. Some people might disagree on New Mexico. Some people might disagree on Michigan, right? And so I think um, we'll be looking at these states and looking at who is going to win, but also whether they're actually competitive, whether both parties actually have a greater than, you know, 35% chance of winning each of these seats. So the first really competitive state, we're going to start on the West Coast here. That's Oregon. Oregon is going to be very close. And if you take a look at the polls, their polls reflect this, and they actually show the Republicans ahead in Oregon right now. So Oregon, as you can see in this governor's race, Christine Drazen, the Republican, leads Tina Kotek, the Democrat, by 3%. This mostly goes as a vote split with Betsy Johnson, the Independent. As you can see right here, Johnson is taking 16% of the vote. And I think that she's going to decline as we hit election day. Again, she's been declining in the polls a fair bit. But like, you know, third parties tend to underperform their polls by a lot. And I think a lot of people who might be saying they're going to vote for Johnson right now are going to break uh, towards either party. I guess I should say towards the main parties on election day. Because again, we know a lot of third party people say they're going to support a third party and then end up voting for a Republican or a Democrat. And so I don't think Johnson's actually going to get 16% of the vote. I think it's going to be close to 12 or 13 that being said, I still think she'll take away enough votes from Tina Kotek, plus the fact that Kate Brown is like a very unpopular incumbent Democratic governor, and that kind of sours Kotek at the top of the ticket. All of that combined makes Christine Drazen, like puts her in a very good spot. Kotek can still, you know, very much win. She still has, I think, a 45% chance of winning because Oregon is a blue state in terms of partisanship. That being said, I still think I, I view Drazen as a narrow favorite if the election were held today, but it's still very competitive. And I think in a state like this, so many independent, you know, so many variables affecting the race, a lot to talk about. So uh, a fool's gold race that we'll be looking at here is Oklahoma. And so if like, I totally get it if you're thinking, wait a minute, why would anyone even think Oklahoma is competitive? Oklahoma voted for Trump by over 32%. It hasn't gone blue in a very long time. And so you know, that's worth, I, I think that's worth something, but let's take a look at the polls and let's take a look at why I think some people view it as competitive. So right now, as you can see, the gap is closing rapidly. Kevin Stitt, the incumbent Republican, holds a lead of only 1%, 1% in Oklahoma of all places over his Democratic challenger, Joy Hoffmeister. Now, this race is really complicated. I'm not going to lie. I cannot do it justice in, you know, 45, 60 seconds. What I will say is that there are a lot of things going into making this race at least kind of competitive. The first thing is that Oklahoma tends to be blue or down ballot, meaning that it's federally Republican, but there's still some people who vote Democrat for like local offices, which is why in 2018, the governor's base was 12% instead of, you know, 32%. Secondly, uh, Oklahoma is dealing with like some serious party fatigue right now because the Republicans have been in control of the state for like a decade. And I think even more than that. Um, and they have been, you know, very unpopular for a while. Again, Mary Phelan, the incumbent Republican governor until 2019, she had like a 7% approval rating. Um, a lot of rural voters who voted for Trump and are very strongly Republican tend to dislike Kevin Stitt because of his education and healthcare policies, which have hurt rural communities in their eyes. And also, Joy Hoffmeister is a really good recruit for Democrats. She's running a really good campaign, and she, um, you know, has the ability to appeal to both the rural voters she needs and also the suburban voters. So, um, and you know, the polls reflect this, by the way. The polls, latest three polls have all had Hoffmeister actually ahead, which is I know it's crazy. I never thought we'd see a day where Democrats are leading in Oklahoma polls, but hey. That's where we are at this point. So, um, you know, I I wouldn't buy into it too much. I still think that Oklahoma is going to be bred by double digits. So that's why I'm going to say it is fool's gold. And I think that, you know, this race is not actually a toss. Because, again, for these states that are, like, actually competitive, like Oregon, for example, I think they're going to be within 3 or 4%. Oklahoma, I'd be st shocked if it's within 3 or 4%. I would be very surprised if that were to happen. And, yes, I think there will be a lot of people who don't like Kevin Stitt on election day who are going to vote for him anyways just because of polarization, just to put it out there. So, that's Oklahoma fool's gold. If you ask me, I would be very surprised. I, I, again, 
These are hot takes. I could be wrong on a lot of these, and I could have egg on my face on November 9th. But, like, here's the thing. Oklahoma is a red state, and I'm going to bank on it being a red state for a very long time until it proves me wrong. So next up, let's go to New Mexico. New Mexico is just a fascinating race because I think there are a ton of outcomes that can happen here. On one hand, I think Michelle Lujan Grisham can win by 7%. I think that's a real possibility. On the other hand, I could see Mark Runchetti eking out a one to two point win over her because New Mexico is a very elastic state. A lot can happen. A lot can change over two years. And I think let's talk with this race. So right now the polls have been getting really bad for Mark Ronchetti. If you take a look at where we are at right now, he is currently losing by 9%. It is getting, you know, he's not even at 40% of the vote. And Michelle Lujan Grisham is wide in her lead again. She was only up by, you know, over just a point in August. She's now up by 9% as this race has kind of, you know, uh, the lead has expanded for her. And that's mostly because the race has become a bit more nationalized. Again, Ronchetti's hope was to denationalize the campaign, make it about a referendum on MLG because she's not a very popular governor. But it's kind of like the reverse Oklahoma in that unlike this race being a local race, it's becoming more and more nationalized. New Mexicans might not like Michelle Lujan Grisham, but they do prefer Democrats over Republicans at the end of the day. So that helps Michelle Lujan Grisham. And I would call her a favorite as of right now. I'd have a hard time making like an objective case for Ronchetti being a favorite. That being said, a lot can change in New Mexico. As we know, turnout is very wacky in New Mexico. If Hispanic turnout in the South really declines and it comes from, and it declines mostly with Democratic voters, and if Ronchetti can do as well in the suburbs as he did in 2020 relative to national partisanship, I can see him actually winning this race. So I think, look, Michelle Lujan Grisham is pretty unambiguously the favorite at this point, but this is like the race I think where a lot can happen, and it's, it would be wise to take our eyes off of it just uh, you know, this early. So the next day we'll be doing is Florida. Florida is fool's gold. There is no way Charlie Christensen's Florida. No way. And I and again, I don't like to give those, you know, no way in, you know, no way in heck chances because I think that they can age very poorly. Because I did in 2020, by the way. I, I got some states wrong in 2020, or I got one state wrong. It was Georgia, which I said that you know, those, you know, Biden had a chance to win Georgia, but I saw it very unlikely. And, you know, I I, I said in my last video, the best he can do is meet and meet Matt match Stacey Abrams' margin of 1.4% loss. And I was wrong. Biden ended up winning Georgia. He really surprised me by winning Georgia. I was you know, pretty flabbergasted when it was that close on election night because I thought he'd lose it by, you know, four or five, right? So I was very wrong on Georgia. And so I've kind of hesitated for making these bold predictions, but I am so sure that uh, Ron DeSantis will win re-election in Florida. That I will, like, do a, you know, I'll, I'll do a dare if he doesn't. Like, not that I think that would be particularly entertaining, but, like, you know, there's no way Charlie Chris wins. Again, the early vote data is only, like, a week. It's very preliminary, but, like, it is getting really bad for Democrats in Florida. And the fact that, like, they're barely leaving the early votes – they're like on track to underperform 2020 by like 15, 16%, which is atrocious for them because 2020 was also a bad year for Florida Democrats. Now, if those numbers hold up, that's what's going to happen. I don't think they're going to hold up. I think Democrats are going to do a little better as as it progresses because, I because again, I'm not saying DeSantis wins by like 18%. I do think he's going to win. I think he's going to win by close to 10 over Charlie Crist. Again, a lot of people, a lot of Democrats have been hoping for Charlie Crist to win because there have been a few polls that have had it close. You got to remember something about Florida. The Florida polls tend to always overestimate uh, Democrats. Again, in 2020, for example, the polls had Biden up by 3% in Florida. He lost it by 3%. There was a 6% error in Florida in 2020. If you apply that same error, DeSantis win by over 13 points. Now, I think it won by closer to 10, but like, you know, the fact that he's still ahead in most polls in the state of Florida, and Florida, again, is a state where the polls underestimate Republicans, a very good sign for him. And the early vote data seems to corroborate that. So I think at this point in time, looking very good for DeSantis and Republicans in general in the Sunshine State. Now, go back to our truly competitive state. Our next state we're going to have on this list, that's Kansas. Kansas, again, this is an example of a state that I have been wrong on in the past. You know, even back in May, I had this race as likely are, and I said there was, you know, very hard time to see Laura Kelly winning re-election. But here's the thing. And this is very important. Laura Kelly has run one of the best campaigns of 2022, and it goes very unnoticed. And that's actually a good thing for her, because here's the thing. In a race, in a state like like, if, if, if you're running as a Democrat in a red state or a Republican in a blue state, you want your race to be local. You don't want it to be a nationalized race because nationalized races are a lot more polarized. But in a local race, people vote more on local issues that are less polarizing, right? Which is why you have, you know, Demo uh, Democrats competitive in Oklahoma and Republicans competitive in, you know, and even winning Vermont and New Hampshire, right? So Kansas has been a local race. Derek Schmidt has been unable to kind of draw GOP eyes to Kansas because, you know, she's running against a fairly uncontroversial incumbent Democrat who's been decently popular throughout her time in office. That isn't to say she's like, you know, well-loved or, you know, super, you know, hyped up by both parties the way Phil Scott or, you know, Chris Sununu or, uh, you know, even Steve Bullock was, right? But Laura Kelly has the 
distinct advantage of being a Democrat in a red state where she hasn't actually been able to do very much to, you know, make Republicans angry, right? Because the Republicans control the state legislature, she, like she hasn't actually done anything that that's kind of like ticked off her, her Republican uh, opponents. That's why she hasn't getting like as strong of a challenge. Now, Derek Schmidt is still a good recruit for Republicans. Don't get me wrong. He is a great candidate to fight Laura Kelly, but she's had a good record as governor for mo- – and again, that, that's not me saying that I would you know vote for her or not vote for her. It's me saying that I think in terms of electability, she's had a good record. And so um, that you know keeps her competitive in a state as red as Kansas against even a good Republican opponent. And if you look at the polls, the polls corroborate this. Again, right now the polls show a dead heat in Kansas. If you take a look at who's ahead right now, I don't even think they have the – maybe they do. Let me let me find it. Kansas right now, yeah, they don't have an average, but uh, you know, toss out Echelon, which I think is a bad poll. She's up by two. She's down by three. She's down by four. She's up by three. She's down by four. You know, these polls average out to what, you know, her being down by like a point and a half. It's a dead heat in Kansas right now. And I think she's still a narrow underdog in my eyes, but this is a truly competitive race with a lot of outcomes. And I know a lot of people think Laura Kelly is going to win. Now, let's talk about another fool's gold race. Let's do the state of Wisconsin. Wisconsin, to me, is not going to be particularly interesting. And this is a hot take. This is the hottest take of the video, by the way, uh, for those of you who are curious. Because, look, a lot of people still think Tony Evers is going to win re-election. Here's the thing. He's not. He's, he's not going to re-election, and I'll tell you why right now. Wisconsin is a right-trending state, and in, in midterms, the electorate gets more and more Republican. In 2020, Biden only won Wisconsin because like Milwaukee as a share of the electorate was decently high and because he was able to hold on to those last Democrats in the rural areas. Now, he got, you know, he got smoked pretty badly in the, with working-class voters, but he made up for it with suburban voters in the Wow counties. But he's, by the way, he still lost Waukesha County, which is like the most, again, Waukesha is a, just my example here, it's a county right outside of uh, Milwaukee. It is a mostly suburban county that is like 65, 35 Republican. Biden did historically well there for a Democrat, although he lost it by a lot still. But, you know, he did better than Pat Democrats in the past because he was able to hold down the margin for Trump in Waukesha. He was able to win Wisconsin. Now, Tony Evers did really poorly in Waukesha in 2018. So he's going to do poorly there again um, in all likelihood. The reason he was able to win 2018 was because he, he was able to do fairly well for a Democrat in the working class areas and in the rural areas. Those areas have zoomed to the right since 2018. He's going to get smoked in both those regions. And if you take a look at Milwaukee from 2018, it's also going to trend right because, again, I think Tim Michaels, the Republican, can do fairly well for a Republican in the city of Milwaukee. Um, you know, the city of Milwaukee itself has been getting a bit less reliable for Democrats in, the, uh, in recent years, especially in 2018, where it, it almost, you know, it almost didn't come uh, come through for Tony Evers in 2018, and I think it won't come through from this time. He's gonna, like I say, he's gonna lose a lot of his ground in rural and working class areas specifically, and I think he's gonna go down. I, I'd be really surprised if this even within a point. I think he loses by three and a half percent. And also, if you, you have to remember, Republicans are also gonna win the Senate race by even more. So a lot of bad things are gonna happen for the Democrats in Wisconsin this year. It's it's gonna be a race. I think a lot of people are gonna be surprised by how much Tim Michaels wins by. Now, another state that's really competitive, unlike Wisconsin is Arizona. Arizona is going to be close. Now, I think at this point, it's pretty clear to me that Katie Hobbs is an underdog. She is running a very bad campaign. Cray Lake's been running a very good campaign, which again, was not expected even a few months ago. A lot of people thought Cray Lake would run a bad campaign and bungle the race, but she's been running a good campaign, unlike Katie Hobbs. And the polls reflect this. The polls have been getting tighter and tighter by the day. If you take a look at our, our recent Arizona polls, Katie Hobbs is actually trailing for the first time now. She had a solid lead. June, she was up by five. She was up by seven in August. Leads started narrowing down to two, three, four, uh, zero percent, and Lake has taken the lead. She's been ahead for a week now. As you can see, Hobbs is running behind Kelly in all these polls. You know, Mark Kelly's led in every single poll, but the polls are much more split between Lake and Hobbs. And again, Katie Hobbs is running behind Kelly by five, six, seven, eight percent in all these polls. Unless you think Kelly's going to win by a lot statewide, it's going to hard. It's going to be hard to see how Hobbs can even win with that delta. Now, she still has some level of appeal to suburban voters, which is why I think she's she still has a chance at this. But she's falling. She's falling fast. And Carrie Lake is running a much better campaign than I think a lot of people expected, which has given her the element of surprise against Katie Hobbs, who's just been running a very undisciplined, poor campaign, objectively speaking. So Arizona going to be very close, as it always is. I would tilt it towards Carrie Lake at this point in time, but it's still worth noting that Katie Hobbs is the shot, and it's, it's, it, it is a competitive race, even if I think we agree that someone's favored to win it. Now, a state that is uncompetitive in the governor's race is, to me at this point, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania keeps getting worse and worse for Republicans. At first, there was some signs that maybe it would be within a few points, even though I think Josh Shapiro, the Democrat, was always favored. But if you take a look at the polls right now, it is getting atrocious for Doug Mastriano. He's down by the most he's ever been down by. He's down by 11 right now. He has never been down this, you know, he hasn't never been down this much before 
Uh, you know, he started off decently strong. He was only down by 3% at the beginning, right, at the offset. Had a good pull to start the election. He's down, you know, 11% now, and he keeps getting worse and worse. He's getting he's getting outspent like 35 to 1 on the airwaves, and, you know, he barely has any ads running on TV anyways. Mastriano has essentially no ground game. You know, a lot of people aren't even showing up to his rallies. Shapiro has, you know, he he's a no performer. He outran Biden by 4% in 2020. Hillary Clinton, he outran her by 3% in 2016. He's a well-known figure statewide. He has appealed to both the suburbs and the working class voters for Democrats. He was, I think, the best recruit they could have gotten. They got the best case scenario. It doesn't help that Mastrano is a bad candidate for the Republicans as well. He hasn't led in a single poll. Even, even Trafalgar, which had Trump winning Pennsylvania, has Mastrano down by 9%. If you take a look at, you know, the past poll, he was only down by 2 If you look at, you know, other polls, like, like for example, Inside Advantage had Trump winning Pennsylvania. He's down by 15. Fabrizio. Uh, which, by the way, you know, they did a poll with impact, so I guess it's a bit more balanced out. But, you know, like, you know, based on my point here is that he's down in all the uh, Republican polls, and he's down by even more in the nonpartisan polls. His best poll was, you know, I guess uh, this high school poll, by, but even then, I think you don't have to count that. His best poll recently has been this Emerson poll. He's only down by 3%, but again, that poll had some severe issues, and even then, he's still down by 3 So, Mastriano... Will do decently well in the rural areas, but beyond that, it's going to be really hard to see him even cracking, you know, forty-eight percent of the vote. So I think he's going to underperform Trump, and he's going to underperform Trump by a lot. Now, final truly competitive state, you know, it's you know, you know what it is. It's Nevada. Nevada is, I think, is going to be the closest governor's race this year between Joe Lombardo and Steve Sisolak. Um, the polls that it raised within as well. You know, the, the thing about Nevada polls is that historically they've always underestimated Democratic support. You know, right now Steve Sisolak is, you know, behind Lombardo by about a point. And historically, that would have given, you know, that would have been a good result for Sislak because, you know, in 2016, Democrats were tied. They won by five in the Senate race. He, you know, Sislak was actually down by half a point in 2018 before winning by 4%. In 2016, Hillary Clinton was down by a point in the polls. She won by 2.5%. So in 2012, 2016, 2018, the polls underestimated Democrats in Nevada. In 2020, they underestimated Republicans, which is why that trend has, you know, some evidence of reversing. I don't want to bet on a major polling miss in Nevada, but... If there is one, it'll probably benefit Democrats. Now, that being said, again, I'm not betting on it, so I do view Lombardo as a narrow favorite. Um, again, Sisolak is a decent governor as in terms of electability. He's not super popular, but he's not super unpopular. Uh, but Lombardo is a good cha- a good challenger. He is you know, sheriff of, La- of Love, Clark County, which is where Las Vegas is. He's, he's going to cut into Democratic margins, and I think he's been running a really disciplined campaign. Um, and that's going to give him the victory over Steve Sisolak. Although, again, I think it's going to be by like under a point. I think it's going to be like you know, 0.6, 0.7% margin of victory for Joe Lombardo, and it's going to be very close. Now, our final Fool's Gold race on the map, that's New York. I think you knew it was coming. And it's it's been really weird because the polls in New York have been very, very close for some reason. So right now, Kathy Hochul only has a lead of about, about 9.6%, and you know Lee Zeldin's surging, right? He's, he's only down by four in this Quinnipiac poll, which is stunning because New York's state they voted for Biden by over 20 points. You know, you'd think that uh, Kathy Hochul would be up by you know double digits in that poll. But no, she's only up by four, and Lee Zeldin's surging. He's leading big time with independent voters. Now, I do think he's going to win independence. I think he's going to do very well in New York City, especially. I think he's going to do uh, decently well upstate. Now, that being said, Kathy Hochul, I, th- I think, is still an underrated incumbent. She's dealing with some issues, I think, in the polls, but the polls are mostly overcorrecting for 2020. And if in, in, you know, if you look at the special election we saw in August, again, you, you, like you don't want to tie a special election that was in one district to the entire state. But if that's any indication, I think the polls are once again in New York going to overestimate Republicans. I think Hochul wins by 13 or 14 at the end, and the people who think this race is competitive are just reading too much into the polls. Because again, if you think New York is competitive because of the polls, you got to think Oklahoma is even more competitive. Because unlike in New York, you know Democrats have actually been winning Oklahoma. Republicans haven't even been winning New York, but they've been closer in some polls. Now, um, I, I, again, I don't think either of these races are really that competitive. I think Oklahoma is going to be a, maybe a, a little closer, but e- either way, either way, um. New York, Oklahoma, non-competitive races, and they're both going to go to their respective parties. And again, undecideds in both these states are, you know, in Oklahoma, undecideds voters are Republicans. They're all going to break for state. In New York, undecideds are Democrats. They're all going to break for Kathy Hochul. So just wanted to point that out there. Now, that's going to wrap up the video. Truly competitive race. These are five most competitive governor's races, I think. It's Oregon, Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, and Kansas. For the, I think, fool's gold overrated races, you're going to get Oklahoma, Wisconsin, Florida, Pennsylvania, New York. Again, I would be surprised if any of these yellow races uh, go the other way from what I'm predicting. I think Wisconsin is like the one that has the most chance of doing so because it is a bit of a hot take, but I'd still, I think my reasoning is pretty sound there. But yeah, so thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you all in the next video.